So, thank you to the friends for having us this evening. Um, I was setting up and there were some people in the room and I looked up and there were all of you people in the room. So thank you for coming tonight. Um, welcome to the graveyard. This is your tour of cemetery art and history and symbolism with the Gravestone Girls. Gravestone Girls' mission is to keep our dead alive by preserving cemetery art and history. Shameless self-promotion, www.gravestonegirls.com. There are indeed three girls. Um, I am the one with the most nerve and the biggest mouth to be able to stand up in front of a room full of strangers and talk to you nonstop for just about 90 minutes. So the other girls let me do that job. The other girls are, that's Melissa. She is our web mistress. She keeps us looking good on the internet. If you've been to the website within the last couple of months, you will notice we have had a big overhaul. It's completely her doing. It's fabulous. She's a genius. I tell everybody about it. And that's Maggie. Maggie and I grew up in Southboro. Melissa grew up out in Munson in Western Mass. And we spent lots of time going to the cemeteries, both independently and together. <coughs> Technology's not compatible tonight, so we're going to do this the old-fashioned way. So what do Gravestone Girls do? They do public presentations like this. We lead cemetery tours. We teach gravestone rubbing classes. And I want to speak about that for just a minute. Um, there is a lot of misconception about gravestone rubbing. It's bad, it's illegal, it shouldn't be done. Um, and Fundamentally, that's just not true. Um, that being said, if you're going to go do a gravestone rubbing, it's your responsibility to be prepared long before you go out there. So you want to make sure you get permission, because there's no sweeping law in Massachusetts that says, thou shalt not rub gravestones. Whoever oversees the burial ground decides what they will and will not allow. And because in the past, some individuals have gone and either tried to clean or tried to read or tried to do gravestone rubbing, then they've done damage because they weren't prepared. They weren't knowledgeable enough about what they were doing. So in doing that damage, the, those few instances have shut down the ability for the rest of us to do it. It's caused the overseers of the burial grounds to go, no way, nobody's doing this. And that's really too bad. Because doing a gravestone rubbing is to create an object that is a document of that stone at a particular point in time. Now, we don't think these things change, but they really do. They're out there day and night, right? 24 7, two, 300 years. Biological growth obscures the faces of them. The lawnmowers throw stones at them and damage them. Unfortunately, vandalism happens. Um, limbs, tree limbs fall on them, they sink, they break, they do change. So to do a gravestone rubbing is to create a picture of that stone as it appears at a particular point in time. But you have to do it properly. You have to do it responsibly. Get yourself an education before you go out. Take a class with the gravestone girls. <laughs> do some reading on places like the Association for Gravestone Studies website. Understand the kind of material, the kind of gravestone material that you're working on, that you want to do a rubbing from, and to know how to determine whether or not that stone is a good candidate. Get, some, uh, get the right materials. Put a barrier between your working surface and the stone. Clean up after yourself. And again, make sure you get permission. Because they're not going to be hard pressed. I haven't heard of any of my gravestone friends that have been thrown in jail for this, for doing gravestone robbing. But it can cause a significant kink in your day when the police come along because a neighbor saw you go in there and, and started touching the stones. So people are trying to be protect, protective. So give yourself a little bit of advantage by having some early permission. That being said, too, um, I grew up rubbing gravestones was a long time ago. Nobody thought about historic preservation the way we do today. Uh, my mother taught me to rub gravestones in the family cemetery when I was a little kid so that I would be occupied and stay out of her hair while 
my mother and grandmother were taking care of the family plot. So years go by, and I've got all these pieces of paper, and it's not enough. I need more than that, because basically when I tell everybody I'm greedy and selfish, I had my favorite stones, I wanted to take them home. And I knew that it would be frowned upon to remove stones from the graveyard. So uh, I used my art history education and my background in small antique restoration to develop a process that I could safely take into the cemetery to collect the images and bring them home. So that brought us to this last thing that gravestone girls do. We make gravestone replicas. I make gravestone castings. And I'm going to send a few of them around the room. Take, it, take a read, take a feel, give it a kiss, pass it along. Is it warm in here or is it just me? Woo! So when I collapse on the floor, somebody bring me a gin. <laughs> That'll help. You might be surprised. There we go. All right. So that's a gravestone casting. That's what's going around the room. We have the ability to actually make a real three-dimensional copy of the stone. Now, while I will teach you to do this, I will teach you to rub gravestones all day long. I will not teach you how to do castings. You know that phrase, I'm a professional, don't try this at home? I am. And you have to think about that I used my education, I sourced the right materials, I got the right guidance to develop a safe procedure. You can't just take any material and go slap it on the face of the stone and go, woo, I'm ready, I'm making castings. Um, even materials that people use to make an impression or to do gravestone rubbing or to do cleaning, even when they think maybe they've, they've cleaned it all off, whether it's a dry material or a wet material, and they've washed the stone all off and, and it's all nice and clean and all the material is gone, you'd be very surprised at the remnants that are left behind, typically chemicals, that can have a very adverse effect on the stones. And it's not that people set out to do this stuff intentionally and cause damage, but you have to have a proper working knowledge of any of these kinds of things before you ever go and touch any of our historic artifacts. So I never intended to become the gravestone girl I am today, but I'm pretty damn happy about it, I gotta say. Um, Maggie and I worked on the process. She, she and I, we did a lot of practicing at home long before we ever went out. And, um, you know, you make a couple and the joke became nothing says Merry Christmas or Happy Birthday like a gravestone. So people started giving them as gifts, asking us to make them to give as gifts. You get a table at the local church fair, you start selling a few, you sell a few more. Melissa comes along makes a beautiful website, and presto, the gravestone girls are born online. And I get an email one day, and in my inbox, that email has this picture here attached to it. It's from a guy in Ohio. He says, this is my seventh great-grandfather's gravestone. It's located in Concord, Massachusetts. And I was just trolling the internet, looking for information how to make a copy of it, because this here is my family's coat of arms. And I'm my family's genealogist, I'm my family's historian, and I'd like a copy of that to put with the other artifacts and mementos of my family's lineage. And since I was just tooling around on the internet and I found the gravestone girls, and I see you ladies do this already, might I commission you to do this work for me? Well, sure. I'm a good capitalist, sure, I'll take you up on that. So we went and we got permission from Concord to do the work, and that's Mag up there. What we actually do to make our casting in the first step is to apply material to the face of the stone to collect the image and then get it home. And then the magic happens, like Disney, the magic happens in the laboratory after that. Um, when we were finished, this is one of the finished pieces. Let me give you some perspective on that. It's a very large stone. The coat of arms itself is about 19 inches in diameter. It's a big piece. Mag's about 5 foot 10. She's probably about 6 feet tall with all that hair on her head. Look how tall that stone is. When you look at a gravestone that's in the ground, if it's upright and at grade, you can assume what you can't see below ground is probably another one-third to two-thirds worth of stone. 
So think about how big that is. If we were to take this piece of slate out of the ground, it would probably be somewhere around nine feet long. That's finished size. It probably would have been at least 10, if not 11 feet and wider with the rough stone that came out of the ground before it was carved into the gravestone that sits out on the landscape. And that stone, was, his death date was 1787, so it's been out there a good long time. So, enough about how fabulous the gravestone girls are. There's plenty more of that later, not to worry. Um, Milford, where we are, where we sit right here and now, you have three, four, five, six, seven cemeteries in the historic record. I went and visited them all. Um, Milford was established in 1780 from Menden. Your oldest burial ground here dates to 1741 and was located right around this building. It was moved several times until it found its final resting place um, in Vernon Grove. And at the time it made the move, it made a move from here to Cemetery Street, which I understand has been renamed, um, and then made the move again to Vernon Grove. And at the time it was moved to Vernon Grove, uh, a number of families decided to take some of their loved ones and put them in um, North Purchase, in their family plots, and in Pine Grove. So that last dissemination of folks went in a number of different directions. So here's all your cemeteries. In preparation for this program, I came to town on a beautiful summer day. I love my job. I came and I visited all the cemeteries and I took pictures because I wanted to use as much local content as possible to build the program you're going to see tonight. I want to show you what's in your own backyards, what's on your main streets, the places you drive by all the time, and why they look like they do, and why they look differently from each other. So that being said, in using these pho photographs for the program, I went to both your ancient cemeteries and your modern cemeteries. So when we get to the modern section of the program, you may see somebody you know. And I will remind you of that before we get there. Know that I'm not trying to um, invade anybody's privacy or, or exploit anything. I'm trying to use the modern images that are in the, in the cemeteries of today to illustrate what we think about death and memorialization, what we think about ourselves, the same way I use the colonial stones and the stones from the 19th century to illustrate what people were thinking and feeling at that time as well. So a little bit of background. The origin and the evolution of the cemetery, two major questions. Why do we bury the dead and where do gravestones come from? Well, we bury the dead because we're only mortal. We've only got a certain amount of time when the body fails, you've got to do something with the remains, with the mortal remains that are left. So you take that body and you put it in a grave. You put stones on that grave, which is where the word gravestone comes from, and you do it for a couple of very good reasons. You do it so you know where you put that person. So if you want to come back, you know where they are. You want to know where you put that person when it comes time to put somebody else in the ground because you don't want to disturb the folks that are already there. And early on, that pile of stones on that grave served the very practical purpose of keeping wild animals from disturbing the grave. The historic record, the archaeological record dating back 50,000 years, at least 50,000 years, and really with the new discovery in South Africa, that could put the idea of burying your dead with, memor with specific ritual and memorialization in mind even farther back than that. But we know many tens of thousands of years, the historic record will show that the people here, man believed in something after this. There's another world that goes on after this. And we know that by, by the burials. We know that by opening up archeological digs and finding interments that have grave goods in it, things that you need for the next world. Aren't these big pointy things really just gravestones? 
They're just big gravestones, right? They mark the spot where Pharaoh is buried, and they are filled with all sorts of wonderful things that Pharaoh needs for the next world. So we've always believed that there is something else after this. Now while I can talk about 50,000 years worth of history, we do not have that kind of time. So I'm going to skip right to the good stuff. The stuff that's on your main streets and on your, on your back roads in the towns all over the New England area. The three major areas, major errors of gravestones and cemeteries are the colonial burial grounds from first settlement in the 1600s through the 1700s, the rural garden movement of the 19th century, and then the modern day of the 20th and 21st century. Initially, if we're burying people, once we land here in the 1620s and start spreading out, when we bury people, we're not erecting, we're not building big cemeteries, we're not, uh, we're not putting big fancy gravestones. We're using very simple things, if we're marking at all. We're using rough stones like this that are used to build the beautiful stone walls that are around the New England area. I'm definitely coming to that guy's lecture. Um, and, and maybe wooden markers that would have deteriorated over time. But we don't, we don't, we use these rough stones initially because they just don't have a lot of ritual. It's not a big deal. So we just, maybe we, we, we definitely bury them and maybe we put something and maybe we don't. Um, I want you to know that from here on out, when we look at all of these slides, they'll say, they'll have a couple of lines up here. The top line will tell you what you're looking at and the second line will tell you where it is. So if you see something you love, make sure you go back out and visit it. I want you to go back out and visit them all tomorrow when it's sunny. You're all looking rather peaked. Take the day off tomorrow. So they're, they're very simple. They don't have any art, very much art on them. If they've got anything, it's a little bit of inscription. Um, maybe we've got some lines of text, but they're, they're pretty simple. And these stones do actually have text on them. Um, a little tough to read because they're this one in particular because it's obscured with biological growth. But you know, it's a nice summer day. You sit out in front of it. You take a little bit of time and read it, and you'll be surprised what you find. The colonial landscape of Vernon Grove. So when I Vernon Grove was the last cemetery I came to, and I'd gone all through town going, "Where is your colonial burial ground?" Now, it wouldn't be unusual to, have, to not have one at all. I live in Worcester. My colonial burial ground was right in the middle of town, just like they all were, just like the original burial ground was here. Um, but in the mid-1800s, my cemetery, my burial ground in Worcester, was put under to make way for the trolley car tracks. Fortunately, it was transcribed before it was buried underground, and every five or ten years when they open up the ground to run Fios or, or something else, they run into the stones again. But for the most part, my colonial burial ground, with all the really good stuff that I like in, at home, in my own hometown, doesn't even exist anymore. So when I got to Vernon Grove, and I went to the back of the, once I cruised around all over, and I went to the back of the cemetery, and I found this, I got very excited. And I will tell you that I took a picture of this, and I posted it on the Gravestone Girls Facebook page and said, know what this is? The answer is no. Um, I said, you know what this is? This is a Gravestone Girls candy store. That's what this is. This is also a perfect example that when you look at a colonial burial ground, what you see today is not the way it originally looked. You need to look at it with eyes that say, this thing has been changed. And I didn't need to know that it had been moved from one place to another to know, just by looking at this, that it had been changed. When you find all sorts of nice, neat rows like that, um, it's a good sign. It's a very good signal that the landscape has been changed over time. Um, and we think of that as sacrilegious. These are sacred grounds. You can't do that. What are you doing moving stuff around? But if you think about it over time, 
You've got people that come in and reorganize for aesthetic reasons. You get people that move burial grounds and reorganize them. You get people that um, come in to, and reorganize things for modern landscaping. There's a lot of stuff that happens. We tend to think of these spaces as static and never changing, but they're actually quite dynamic. Gravestones have parts, too. Um, you've got headstones and footstones. The headstone marks the beginning of the grave. The footstone marks the foot or the end of the grave. And the body is in between. There's a tympanum on the top where the art is contained. There are shoulders on either side. There's information in the middle tablet that says simple biographical information who they are, how old they were, when they died, pretty simple. Later on, we get a third part at the bottom called an epitaph. A couple of lines, two lines, four lines, maybe longer, um, some kind of poetry or prose, <coughs> rhyming verse, often, often biblical, um, parts of hymns, parts of uh, l modern literature of the time that would have been very easily recognizable. All of it meant to speak to the population about mortality and morality. And when they set them up like this with a headstone and a footstone, this is symbolic of your bed for eternity. So if father is six feet tall, and you put a, so you put a headstone here and there, a footstone there, there's going to be six foot between the headstone and the footstone. You bury mother next to him, and she's five feet tall, there's going to be a five foot spread between her headstone and footstone. So using that logic, these guys were all the same height. <laughs> Good guess, but incorrect. What it is, is another great visual cue that this, excuse me, that this space has been reorganized. Isn't this just about the right amount of space for a lawnmower to go through? So, when these footstones get pushed back like this, they sort of create their own row. And, and people will often say to me, oh, look at those tiny stones. Those, those are so small. Those must be for children. And I tell them, well, probably not, but there's a way you can tell. And you can actually see a little bit of it here. Do you see that letter right there? So the way you can tell if the little stones go with the big stones is they're going to have something in common. So if my headstone says Brenda J. Sullivan, then my footstone is going to bear my initials or my name, something that links the big stone to the little stone. Now, I go places where there are no footstones at all. Um, in many cases, when they get reorganized, if we're lucky, these get put out into their own row. Or if we're lucky, they get tucked up against the backside of its parent. But if we're not so lucky, over the stone wall they go, outside into the woods. They get used for people's patio stones. They get used to prop up other gravestones. I've seen them a as window ledges in buildings. You see them all over the place. Um, our, our concept of, current concept of historic preservation is very different than it was even in the 1960s. So where we're currently holding a, a, a philosophy of returning things to its original order. It's not the way it was even less than, less than 50 years ago. So these headstones and footstones are put together initially on the landscape with a very specific orientation. It's called east-west axis orientation. What we're actually looking at here is the back side of that headstone. So the head is here. The writing is on the other side facing west. And the footstone is back here. So the head of the grave and the foot of the grave. The body itself is facing east. The belief system at the time said, at the end of days, on Judgment Day, the Archangel Gabriel is going to come from the east. And he's going to blow his trumpet, signaling the day of resurrection and judgment. And all the dead are going to sit up in their graves at the sound of that trumpet, facing east, that way, to meet their maker. This is an important call. You do not want to miss it. 
You want to be ready. Here's that anatomy picture that I was talking about. The anatomy of the gravestone. So here's the shoulder, the tympanum, where the art is, the other shoulder. Here's the biographical information. This was the oldest stone I could find, and that doesn't mean anything other than it was the oldest one I could find that day. It doesn't mean that there weren't older ones before them that are now gone. It doesn't mean that, you see all of that? That's biological growth. Um, so there's a lot of times there's so much bio on it you can't read the face of the stone. This one says 1749 for a death date. So this is very simple biographical information and then that epitaph I was talking about comes later and comes down here under the, uh, under the biographical information on the stone. I get asked a lot. What on earth were they thinking putting skulls on stones? What was wrong with them? What was wrong with them? Death was everywhere. Death was omnipresent. Sin was omnipresent. You had the opportunity to die at any second. You had the opportunity to commit some grave sin that would send you to hell and eternal damnation in the blink of an eye. You had one immortal soul. Your job was to keep that soul as free and clean of sin as possible and do good and virtuous work while you were here because that's what you would be rewarded on in the next life. Because this was just temporary. Life on living life, human life, was just temporary. It was a very difficult existence. Put, your shoe, put yourself in the shoes of the people of the 17th century, the 18th century. Very, life's very hard. You're spending all your time just trying to survive. And you've got to hold up under that. And how you hold up on that, under that determines what happens to you the day Gabriel shows up. So the idea is the flesh fails and that soul is allowed to leave its earthly prison, spread its wings, and fly off to the next world. We use a skull here because at the time, they're very literal, they're very religious, they're very super, superstitious. To use anything other than what's left after the body dies, to use an image that looked human or to use an image that looked like an angel or a heavenly host, would have been considered sacrilegious and would have been a graven image. So that's why we see so many of these skulls on the old colonial stones. I love this guy. I know he's broken, but he's still really beautiful from the nose down. <laughs> Those are the only two I found, but that doesn't mean anything. It just means they're the only two I found that day. Like the other example, it doesn't mean that they didn't exist before. There certainly would have been many of them before. And actually, I did see several others that were obscured with a lot of biological growth, and they just would have made lousy pictures, because I might have been the only one that would have been able to see them and understand that there was a wing skull on there. So that, that wing skull, that's the soul. It's called a death's head. Um, and again, the soul flying off to the next world. There are messages about mortality and morality. And they're a picture language that speak to the population about those two very important subjects. You had a large portion of the population that couldn't read and write, so you spoke to them in a picture language. Because these spaces were in the middle of town, typically near your meeting house, and the meeting house was the place you went for religious services, it's the place you went for social gatherings, it's the place you went for town government, and other types of events. So here's a place you're going all the time, and here's the burial ground right next to it. And here are these guys looking up over at you. Get the message, guys? Right? There's a Latin phrase up here that says memento mori. Think on death. Remember your mortality. That picture language spoke to the people that couldn't read and write. It spoke to the people that could read and write in this kind of visual cue sort of a scared straight program, you know, you're walking down on the way to the meeting house and this guy's looking at you from over the wall <laughs> as you're thinking about how your wife didn't make such good coffee this morning. That's enough to send you to hell, guys. Sorry. 
It was that visual cue for them that if they didn't stop and read all the written words on the stone. And um, Latin was the language of the law and the language of religion. So we get them all. We get the highly educated. We're speaking to the everyday man that was literate, and we're also speaking to the illiterate. This is a beautiful stone in Hartford, Connecticut. The Latin here says, Ficus ti gravi finitur. Well, that's fabulous, but guess what? You do not need to know how to read Latin to understand this picture, this 18th century gravestone picture. You are the tree. The tree is something that's living. It has a definite beginning and a definite end. It's living, it, and its life can be interrupted at any time. Now, you as the tree are having a particularly bad day <laughs> because your maker has come out of the clouds with his hatchet and felled your tree. Hope you were ready, because it happened just like that. They wanted, they were cons cons constantly driving home the idea that it could happen to you, it could happen at any moment. So the Latin here translates to, I am done. A grave fear comes to an end. Well, yeah, certainly, if you're the tree, you're done. But a grave fear comes to an end. Remember, literal, religious, superstitious. I got up every day and I worried about the, the safety and security and the transition of my immortal soul from this life to the, to the next, all based on my actions. I worried about it every day. I tried to correct and check myself every day. This is all philosophy, of course. But now I'm done. That's it. My maker's called my name, and that's it. I've done what I can, and I hope it's enough. But not to worry. Death is not a permanent condition. You've got a gravestone here. This one's out in Oxford, and it says, very lightly inscribed across the top, grave is God's hiding place. Kind of like God's waiting room. Not a permanent condition, because what are you doing? You're hanging out waiting for something important, right? You're waiting for that call, waiting for Gabriel to call, to signal the idea of the resurrection. Judgment day, resurrected, redeemed of your sins, and heading off, ascending off to the next world. I usually just use this one to illustrate the point of this goal, because that is the goal right there. You want to go up. I recently came across this in Concord because... I did a big project for them just recently. See that happy looking guy right there? <laughs> Not scary at all, is he? It says, all must submit to the king of terrors. Death was known as the king of terror and all must submit to the king of terror. You too shall die. But through Christ, we conquer, rise and reign forever. The promise of something better after this. As we come into the beginning of the 1700s, around the 1730s, there's, a, um, there's an age of enlightenment that says, we've, you know, we've been here about 100 years or so. We have several natural born generations. And um, they're moving away from the very strict puritanical religious ideas. They're still very religious. They're still believing that the work they do is what's going to get them in or keep them out of heaven. But they understand that not every little thing you do, not every little transgression is going to send, send you down into eternal fire and brimstone. You're still concerned about your mortal soul, but you can go through your day without living in mortal terror. You now can have a relationship with your maker, and your, your maker understands you and knows what your true intents are. So you're still responsible for the direction of that soul. But now, the modern symbol of the time, that winged skull, that death's head, is allowed to grow some skin and take on a humanistic or an angelic reference without being without running the risk of being considered a graven image. Now know that when you see all these happy faces on the stones, I think he looks kind of happy. 
This isn't the guy laying in the grave. It's not meant to be a portrait of an individual. You see too many of them that look the same for them to possibly be representative of the person in the ground. Carvers, gravestone carvers, cut in particular styles. Some changed over time. Some never changed their style. Many had apprentices of sons or outside children that were apprenticed to them that learned the trade and initially, if not inevitably, picked up the carving style. So there's no, this is simply meant to be the idea of being human, not being the individual human. Other symbols I found on gravestones, particularly here in town, I saw a lot of this. Um, abstract, curly things, and, and you, I'll probably say this another 10 times as we go through, but there's, there's no absolutes here. So it might mean this, might mean that. Um, in this, this, I saw a lot of these. Um, there's a particular carver that worked around this area that this, this type of swirly can be ascribed to. Um, it might be leaves unfurling. It might be the idea of clouds. The sun, look at him peeking out, isn't he adorable? Look at those eyebrows. The sun setting on this life, but also rising on the next life. We've got some really lovely, rather abstracty flowers here, just like the tree, something living, something that has a, a definite end. When you read somebody's gravestone that says, as in this case, this person aged 71 years, two months and 28 days. 28 days. If I got up every day with good intention and did the best work I could to keep that immortal soul clean and free of sin so it could get off to the next world, if I drop dead on the 29th day, I want credit for my 28 days. It shows intent. I got up, I meant it, I tried, I tried. As we get to the last quarter of the 1700s, what happens? Don't we tell some guy across the pond, some king guy across the pond to take a hike? Say, you know what, thanks, no thanks, we're going to represent ourselves from now on. We have this big thing, big to do, called the revolution. And the founding fathers are looking for something to pattern this new nation on. So they look to the ancient societies of the Greeks and the Romans who were the founders of the ideas, the concepts of democracy and the republic, the idea of being able to govern, man governing oneself. And what happens is there's a, an embrace of this neoclassicism. So the architecture takes on Greco-Roman style facades with pediments and columns, federal furniture, the style of dress is influenced by this. And what happens in the land of the living happens in the land of the dead as well. And the iconography on the stones starts to change in response to what's happening in the modern society of the time. So in addition to this philosophy about classicism, there's also actual archaeology going on over in Europe, over in Greece. They're excavating. Um, Pompeii and Herculaneum in Italy are found around, uh, around this time, actually during the revolution, before the end of the revolution. And they're finding these kind of things. Urns, funerary urns, cinerary urns, vessels that carry the body to the next world. And it gets adopted here. And it starts showing up on the gravestones. They use trees, too, just like we saw the trees and the flowers before. Um, the idea here, see the split in the tree? That idea of the life that has been interrupted? We see them separately, but, and we then also see them combined, and they become the very common, um, very omnipresent symbol, the urn and the willow, on gravestones of the 19th century. So the tree, something living, and the vessel, something dead, a beginning and an end 
Um, what I really love about this particular one, and I see it periodically, there's a split in the tree here, but see this? The life that comes out of that, still the promise that there's something more after this. Pardon the poop. <laughs> Always works out that way. If I cleaned every stone before I took its picture, my programs would be like three slides long. But I used this one because it was really beautiful and it's really well lit. So this is a gateway. Here's your urn and your willow. This is terra firma. All of the rest of this is an idea. It's a, a message. These neoclassical style posts, that is the entrance to the burial ground, the gate that you walk through to enter the burial ground. It's the, it's the entrance to the tomb. And it's also the portal from this life to the next. It's a lot going on there. It's really lovely. Now this looks different, doesn't it? Anybody know this place? Yeah. Good job. Good job. Now, that, now see, if I now ask you who goes into the burial grounds here in town, I want to hear as much of a resounding answer. <laughs> this is Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The first rural or garden cemetery that was established in 1831 with a donation of about 7, 75 acres of land set aside by the Massachusetts Horticultural Society, initially to create an arboretum, a place for trees, a place for greenery. This looks really different than that colonial burial ground we've been looking at, right? This is a cemetery. This is the first time a burial place is called a cemetery. Cemetery comes from the Greek word that means sleeping place or dormitory. There's a completely different way of looking at death now. They still know they're going to die. They still know they're going to, they want to go to heaven. But they are the modern people of the time. We have changed from being an agrarian culture to moving into the cities and working in the factories and becoming an industrialized nation. So we're the modern people of the time. We've got factories that make goods and, and build things for us. So life is easier. It's not easier than it is today. And I'm not saying that life in the 19th century was a walk in the park. But it was a lot easier than it had been for the predecessors. Don't spend all your time just trying to stay alive. So they consider themselves this new modern population and they look back at those dark stones and those hairy, scary images with those axes and all those ugly faces peering out. And they say, what a bunch of barbarians. We don't think like that. Hatches, hatchets don't come out of the sky and wipe us out. No, no, no. Death is a pleasant experience. It's an easy transition to move from this world to the next. You walk just like walking through the door. There's a veil between this world and the next. It, it's not easy to go out all the time, but it is not the horror that it was perceived by the colonists and put up on their gravestones that way. This is a time of great industrialization. This is a time of modernity gone crazy. People, there's a middle class, there is uh, abilities and opportunities to do all kinds of things. And because we've moved away from that, industri from that um, agricultural landscape, this is an oasis. It's green grass, it's trees, it's rolling hills. Everything about this burial space is different, including the markers. Different material, different shapes, different sizes. Think about the Victorian mindset of the time. They're, very, they're uh, very sentimental, they're very ornate, they're very detail-oriented and in, every, in their everyday life and in the land of the dead it happens the same. Um, you've got people like Hawthorne and Thoreau and Longfellow writing about nature. The idea of being able to commune with nature, commune with the spirits. 
the people that go before you aren't really gone. They're just not physically present anymore. They're still part of the family. They're still there to be remembered. And this is where you go to remember them. Not a bad place to spend eternity, right? When Mount Auburn gets opened in 1831, it causes a sensation. It is just like the same tourist attraction that it is today. Because it's green open space. This is four miles outside of downtown filthy industrialized Boston. And people flock here because they miss, because it's a new object on the landscape, but also because it's open green space. And it inspired the landscape architects of the time. This cemetery inspired them to the idea of a public park system. And Mount Auburn inspired the creation of Central Park in New York. Here is your Victorian landscape, your 19th century lovely landscape. Didn't, this is my office. Isn't that nice? That's where I got to work that day. Green grass, pathways, we've got a lake here. We've got all these different shapes and sizes of monuments. When Mount Auburn is founded, it's brand new. It's a brand new concept, and it goes crazy. It causes everybody to start building these spaces. And people are moving their dead, the ancestors, from the older burial grounds to these new spaces, to these new modern cemeteries. This is the first time that you get the opportunity to do something like this. You get an opportunity to buy a family plot in these newfangled cemeteries. Your own home away from home, as it were, your own vacation spot. And some people did nothing to their spaces. Some people did things to their spaces in terms of laying a foundation. A lot of times, there's just corner markers like this. Sometimes we see them all lined off with stone. That's called curbing. There's your front door. Um, the thing about these central, uh, about these family plots is we end up more often now with a central monument, maybe nothing else in the plot. That central monument will have the names and information of the people buried there. Sometimes there are small stones, like there is down here, um, that will have the, the names or just the initials inside to mark where each of the individual um, graves is made. These are very social places, too. Cemeteries of the 19th century are very social places. You go here a lot. You go to visit. You go to picnic. You're going to talk to the dead people, but you're also going to talk to all the people you know, all the living people you know, because they're all here, because this is where you go. To, to die in the 19th century for the Victorians was very inconvenient, but it was far worse to not be remembered. And the people that are still here want to work to keep that memory alive. So they come here a lot. And if, I, if my neighbor bought a plot and I liked my neighbor, I might be moved, because this is sort of a keeping up with the Joneses kind of thing, I might be moved to buy a plot and buy a plot near them. Because now we can socialize in the cemetery too and our dead can keep each other company. And if I don't buy, like my neighbor, I buy something on the other side of the cemetery. And when you have all these plots and all these foundations on the landscape, they very much form a neighborhood, a sense of community. The symbols are softer. No more hatchets, no more skulls. The idea of the chain, the break in the family chain, the dove, um, innocence and peace, the lamb, the lamb of God, um, often used you know, and also signaling innocence um, often used for young children. And this lovely here, it looks like a stage set, doesn't it? It's fantastic. We've got some drapery with the tassels. Here's the, here's the willow. And in, in place of the willow, we've got an obelisk. An obelisk is an even older object. Um, it's an Egyptian object. And it's wide at the base, and it tapers going up. So it gives the feeling of movement, that idea of rushing heavenward. 
And I want to I use this guy because he really points out something beautiful. This is marble. This is marble. This is marble. And that's marble too. It's all marble. Marble becomes the preferred material with this new cemetery movement because we now have canals with barges that can bring stone from other places. We have railroads and railroad tracks can bring stone from other places. We've got boats that can bring Carrera marble from Italy. We now don't have to use just our local material. And it's chosen because it's now available, um, as well as it's symbolic in and of itself. It's white, it's bright, it's symbolic of heaven and purity, um, very much in keeping with that 19th century high sentimentality and high emotion. Um, when you look across what they would call a marble orchard with all of these marble stones, when you look at them today and they look like this, try and remember that. Um, the was a great idea to change from slate to marble, except that slate is much more durable than marble. Slate is a sedimentary material that's built up in layers, and then the pressure of the earth fuses those layers together. That's why those stones, those slate gravestones, are so easily readable now, even 300 years later, where so many of, of the marbles are broken or discolored or worn away because they're made up of a large por portion of calcium carbonate. They have a much looser grain pattern, so they're very susceptible to wind, rain, erosion. They're very porous as well and absor uh, absorb the atmospheric pollutants and cause the stones to discolor like this. It's not such a bad thing to die. Look what's going to happen. Off to the angels. No more hatchets. The angels come and carry you away. Happy repose, right tucked right in there is a little lamb um, for a young child. Um, again, with that high sentimentality, I often find child sculpture on the landscape um, from grieving parents that had money that were able to erect lovely sculpted, personalized sculpted monuments to their deceased children. And they had to use this. This is the top of the stone. It's broken off from here. So it's down here on the ground, leaning up against the big guy. But do you see that? The moth, the chrysalis that becomes the butterfly yeah. onto the next world. It's a transformation. It's still exactly the same thought process as the 16 and 1700s. This is just telling the story in a more modern language. Flowers like the trees, like the flowers we saw before, fragile, definite beginning, definite end, a full flower, the bloom that has come to fruition, a life that's been fully realized and experienced. Here for these sweet little names, there is always, the Victorians are always Haley, Benny, Mikey, Eddie, Willie, sweet pet names, and they were called pets too. Here, the blooms that don't open, the flower that never gets to realize its full potential, um, often used for children and young women, that bud that never opens. And that's where we get the phrase, nipped in the bud. Neat, isn't it? I love this stuff. <laughs> there are other nature nods um, in keeping with all of that poetry and all of that ideology of the time about nature and, and spiritualism. I found all three of these here in Milford between Pine Grove and St. Mary's. This was kind of hard because it was backlit, but I had to have it. So here's the tree, and it's got acorns. And here are some acorns. So typically, oaks are used for men. The mighty oak, the man of the house, um, and the idea of his progeny. He's no longer here, but his children are, his acorns are, and they will go on. Um, the broken tree and a beautiful tree stump on the landscape, all made out of marble. If you're looking for me, 
just look up. So this is no different than, the, than that winged skull. It's just the modern symbol of the time. It's still the idea of aspiring to get to the next world. Um, it's the idea of goodbye in this life, hello in the next life, the promise that we'll meet again. That hand that reaches out might be your maker helping you over, might be people that went before you helping you, welcoming you to the next world. Um, goodbye in this life and hello in the next life. A couple other things that I often see on the landscape, I didn't see any here in Milford, but I wanted to make sure I told you about them. Um, these are called table stones. There's three of them. One here, one here, and one here, right tight up against each other. And then this is called a box tomb. Do not let anyone tell you there's a body in there. There is not. The body is in the ground. These are more symbolic objects on the landscape. So, back hundreds of years in Europe, where was the best place to be buried? In the crypt of the church. Where was the crypt? Under the altar. So these are all symbolic of the altar. So the, the crypt was for members of the clergy, important patrons of the church that bought their way in, all the rest of you riffraff outside. So when I see these, they are often for members of the clergy, or I see them um, for founding fathers of a particular town. So I might come in, and if I'm able to read the tops of these tablets, it might say, Reverend so-and-so, pastor of this commune, of the first parish church for the last 274 years, or um, <coughs> Major Wallace, or... Um, Mr. John Redding, and I know that Redding Street is right over there, or Redding School is named after this. You know, you, you, get the, you can find a correlation between the clergy and important members of the family by the information on the stones, and it's a throwback to that idea of the crypt. Um, two things. With the tables, when you see them, don't lean on them. Don't look up underneath them, although gravestone girls do it all the time. Um, they can be very unstable, as with any stone, really, but you know, depending on how skinny those legs are. Um, and underneath this veneer, you may find um, a brick box that makes the form of that box tomb and then the nice stone veneer on the outside. Um, other times, it's just four pieces of stone with the top on it. So if you find one that's collapsed, you're able to see inside of it. Um, or if parts of the stone have broken, you can see the brickwork on the inside that makes the structure. The other problem, um, these are horizontal. So what happens to them? It rains on them. It snows, snow piles on them. But they stay wet longer. Um, they're very often, as in this case, made of brownstone or made out of marble. So they erode even that much faster and can be very difficult, if not impossible, to read because they've been totally eroded. Other objects I see on the landscape, this is a hill tomb. It's a tomb built into a hill. It's a lot of hard vocabulary in the gravestone world. This is a, just another type of structure. So what we've seen all the way up to here have been in the ground burials, in the ground interments. This is sort of like that, but somewhere in between. Um, what you, when you see this hill covered with sod, what's underneath it is a brick arch that creates that vault. Here's the front door. And it's been buried up and then sealed. Um, that would have been almost, in many cases, a full-size door that you opened the door you walk down a few stairs, and it opened up into this chamber. And that's where you see where they've put the caskets. The caskets are placed inside of this chamber. They are stacked on each other on the floor. They might be put up on, on brackets or some sort of shelving on the sides. But they are um, they're not actually put into graves in the ground. This is the idea of the grave house. 
Um, I see them sealed up very often. They can be, if they're not maintained, they become very unstable, which makes sense. Um, don't try to play king of the hill on top of there. You might get a rude awakening one day. Um, when they're sealed up, sometimes the remains are inside. Sometimes the remains are removed and buried elsewhere. If they are open, if you're outside in the cemetery on a 113 degree day, which I have been, um, it's very nice and cool in there. But you also have to remember that all sorts of creepy crawlies can be living inside of it. So. Worship from afar, I guess, is the idea. And some people's houses are just nicer than others. I had a ball at St. Mary's. There was a lot of really great stuff to see. And when I came around the corner and saw this small little home away from home, I knew I needed to take his picture. Um, so this is called a mausoleum. This is truly a home away from home. This is a house type structure. You walked up the front lawn, up the front walk here, up the front stairs, and the family held the keys to those beautiful bronze doors. And you opened the doors and you went inside. You go inside to visit, you go inside to put flowers, you may go inside to, to sweep and tidy up. There might be a kneeler or a table and chairs in there. You can sit and do that memento mori thing. You can think about the people that have gone before. You can think about your own mortality. You can think about the idea that you're all going to be reunited eventually. Um, this one, if I remember, because of course, I'm going to go press my face right up against those doors and see what's going on inside. Um, it's got niches on the sides. Um, they're almost like lateral files, so they're horizontal. So you put the casket in the niche and then cover it with stone, and on that outside stone you would have the person's name and date. It's usually, when I see them, they're usually pretty simple. Um, I looked to see if perhaps there was a downstairs with this, but I couldn't tell. A lot of times when you look through the doors, if you see because these things are covered in marble inside and out. If you see something in the, in the middle stone of the floor that looks like it might have um, little, little latches that lift up or something that you would attach a, a lift to pull the stone up, many of these actually have another level underground, another chamber underground. Um, I don't remember how many were in here, but I've seen them that sleep 20, 30, 40, people, enormous and lovely. And very much, I mean, really, I know I'm in the Italian section of the cemetery, but very much uh, neoclassical with its pediment and facade, um, its capitals and columns, it's made out of marble, and it's in lovely shape. It's in, it, you know, it needs work for being outside for as long as it has been, but still pretty impressive. And if you have a home away from home, don't you need furniture? I can't make this stuff up. <laughs> this stuff writes itself, honest to God. This is Hope Cemetery in Barry, Vermont. If you need a road trip, I suggest you go here. Um, this is just a couple miles down the road from the Rock of Ages quarry. And it's been in business for more than 120 years. And that quarry is a granite quarry. And the granite that comes out of it is this beautiful blue-gray light pale blue, um, and it's got a lot of mica in it. And mica is a reflective mineral, so like the, the silvering on the back of a mirror. So between the beautiful ethereal color of the stone and all the silver flashing around, the place really shimmers. Um, and it is, these two objects are by no means an anomaly on the landscape. There's a deathbed scene, there's an airplane, there's a race car, there's a cat, there's this amazing Art Nouveau statue of a man smoking a pipe and the smoke is swirling up into the beautiful bust of a woman. <laughs> Not a bust of the woman, a bust of the woman. Um, it's a family show. You gotta go to late night for that kind of stuff. Um, soccer balls, fish, 
you name it, they got it. Um, because it was just a few miles down the road from the Rock of Ages quarry that quarried granite for architecture but also for, um, for gravestones, they had a lot of European stone cutters. And the stone cutters were very talented and very competitive. I guess the moral of the story here is if you're going to spend eternity in bed, you're going to do it properly with two beds. <laughs> you will hold hands, you love birds. And you will wear your pajamas. <laughs> you see that empty chair? You better believe that there's an empty chair in the cemetery. There's a gravestone girl sitting in it. <laughs> the idea that, you, know, you go around, you don't step on the flowers. Yeah. <laughs> you swing your legs over the side. And, no. Well, yeah, maybe. The idea that empty chair, I've just stepped away. I haven't gone far. That gone but not forgotten, just, just off in the next room, still very close, not physically present but still very close. The way you set an empty place at the table, set a, a place for the person that's no longer there, it's a way of remembering. Now, I've spent all this time telling you all of this. This means this, and this means that, and this is what you should think when you see. And it's all true. I didn't waste your time. I, but I want you to be cognizant of the fact that monuments are made by people for people. If you want to have your own monument, you want to have the last word, you have your monument made before you leave. Or your family does something to memorialize you for what they knew and liked about you. Or in some cases, I've seen what they didn't <coughs> like about you. But you have to be willing to accept all of the existentialism that I've given you, but also the simplicity of the idea that maybe this was just their favorite chair. Getting deep, isn't it? heavy. The modern landscape looks a lot different than the last two we saw, right? As we get out of the 19th century, we're making another big change. We've got a first world war. We've got strides in modern medicine. We've got a lot going on and there is a backlash against the over ornamentation, the high emotion, and the very complicated nature of the Victorians in their 19th century everything. So just like it happened last time, everything changes. Architecture changes. We've got an arts and craft movement that changes architecture and furnishing. Dress is changing. Women are cutting their hair. They're not wearing the corsets and the big dresses with the big sleeves. And it's, life is easier. Life is simpler. And life is simpler on this landscape as well for a number of reasons. We, we want to make a move back to that pastoral idea. You don't want that busy, hard on the eye landscape that marks every rural garden cemetery ever created in the 19th century. We've got a new material available. We've got granite. We've got pneumatic tools to get it out of the ground. We'd make a change to the shapes and the sizes to keep that even look across the landscape. And these are also places we don't go as much. We don't go here as much because we're not dying as much. The death that was omnipresent, inevitable, and inescapable every day in front of the folks of the colonial and the Victorian period, not to us, Medicine has moved so fast in such a short period of time, we fight disease all the time. Once they understood how disease was spread, once they understood what germs were, once they understood about sanitation, simple things like washing your hands and not throwing your chamber pot out the window into the street. <laughs> once they understood that stuff, they were able to get their water clean and keep disease from spreading amongst themselves. Um, we get antibiotics. You get a cut, no big deal. Put some ointment on it and a Band-Aid, you're fine. It's not going to be fatal. You need a kidney? I can give you one. We're getting our organs swapped out all the time. We're getting arms and legs, brain surgery. Um, 
in utero surgery, we're doing genetic engineering, we are cheating death on a regular basis. So the ever-present death that was known to the folks before us, we don't know. So we don't go here. So we don't have to talk about it. This, this place and the idea of the failure of our own mortality is a closeted issue, closeted subject. It's unpleasant. Of course, nobody likes to die, but it, we've forgotten the idea that it can happen to us and that it could happen at any moment. Nothing's changed about that. You just, if something happens to you, your chances of surviving it are a lot better than they were for all the generations before you, even just a couple of generations before you. So we changed the landscape, we changed what we put on the stones, and now for a good period, there's not much there. Just a name, maybe a, a birth year and a death year. No other information. You know that dash we talk about, the dash in between that is the life that happened? Well, we can't see that. I can't meet anybody here. I can't walk through the gates of a modern cemetery and find out about individuals, about families, about society at a particular point in time. They've fallen silent. The good news is, in the last 40 years or so, 30 years or so, back around the 80s, we've decided we had a change of heart. We decided we wanted to say something about who we were and the things that we did while we were here, and we start putting that on our stones. So this is the part where I remind you that the next couple of slides, you might see somebody you know. And I'm using it to illustrate what we're thinking and feeling right now about ourselves and our loved ones in society, the same way I just did for the two periods before that. We put pictures on stones. We want to say who we were. And OK, I, I give. These aren't modern pictures. They're still early, uh, early to mid 20th century. Um, in St. Mary's, there were all these really fabulous photo ceramics. And that's what these are. They're, again, more difficult vocabulary ceramics that have photos enclosed on them, sealed in. So now I've got a face with a name on the stone. And a very handsome face with a lovely fedora, I might add. There's those hands again. The promise of being reunited. This was a lovely monument um, for this Italian family. There's three of them there, the mother, the father, and the daughter. And the daughter died at the age of 18. I know that because I could do the math between the birth and death date. And clearly, she must have died shortly after graduation, but maybe she even died before. And she wasn't able to graduate. And I, I would bet that it wouldn't take very much to go ask Mr. Google Google that name, Google her name, and see. You might be able to find something about her, whether it's old newspapers, whether somebody's done family genealogy. They all have stories to tell. So we wanted to say not only who we were, what we looked like, but the things that we enjoyed. Anybody recognize that place? Oh, yeah. Right, easy, right? Nubble Light up in York, Maine. Um, Somebody loved the sea, the open window with the breeze coming through, moving the curtains, the shells on the windowsill. I actually saw two of them in two different locations. They were lovely. Um, this was really great. Um, we like the woods, obviously. We like the moose. I live in Worcester. I had a moose in Worcester a couple blocks from my house just a few days ago. <laughs> so moose, they're not just for cemeteries and woods anymore. Um, with his beautiful sculpted lettering with the family name. Um, not only do I know what he looked like, apparently he loved to bowl. Bowling is a military thing. I had family in the military, and my uncle and my aunt champion bowlers. Um, but if I wanted to take the time by looking at what he's wearing and the the stripes on, on his uniform, I'd be able to tell even more about him. <coughs> All of that technology says that 
using it in creating gravestones, like that one with the bowling, the bowling pin on bowling ball on it, that was done with laser. Um, sometimes they're done with laser, sometimes they're done by hand. Some very incredibly patient and talented people doing grave etching like that to create those pictures. But what it says is that we're using technology to understand who we are and the things that influenced us both in our living lives and in our dead lives. Video. I know it seems crazy, but it's true. So the name of this company is Vidstone. And what you're looking at is, this is a video box right here. And this is the door. It's about seven inches in diameter. And that what you're looking at is the door is open. You take that door and you close it over the screen. And it's weatherproof. Um, it runs on solar power. It'll hold a charge for up to three days, and it runs about an hour of still video. Still video, big deal. What an antique that is, right? Um, I, am, I did a little bit of checking on these guys not that long ago. I don't think they're, I don't think they're around anymore. Um, I believe they've been supplanted by this technology here. You guys recognize this? Yeah. Right? It's a QR code. QR stands for quick response. It is the same thing as the UPC barcodes that we're so used to seeing on everything. Um, and what it really is for is for those of us too lazy to type www.gravestonegirls.com, we can just scan that code. So that's been enlarged for your viewing pleasure. It's about this big, about an inch in diameter. It's a little metal button. And it's called a memory medallion, and it's made by a company called Memory Medallion in Pennsylvania that holds the patent for using QR technology for memorialization. So they use it on these kind of objects that go on gravestones. They use them in pendants. They use them in frames. They have the patent for using QR technology for, um, for memorialization. So the idea is. You buy this little button, they include it on your gravestone, and your gravestone goes out on the landscape. And some nosy gravestone girl like me comes along, sees this, gets all kinds of excited, whips out the cell phone, which is the part, this is the part where you can play along. You got a smartphone that you've downloaded a QR reader app to. And you go over to that, and this always takes a little finagling of a bagel, and it failed me last time, which was really very sad, because it really does work. So you point your phone with that app at the QR code, and it takes you to that person's website. Wow. 999 spaces to do whatever you want with. You can put your personal poems out there, you can put your correspondence, you can put your fiction, you can put your anything. Genealogists, you can put your family history information out there. All your research that you've done, you can put it out there. Um, my favorite story, and it, it, if you went to Memory Medallion's website, or you sat in the audience and did what I just did with your QR reader, the, the sample page that it takes you to is a real lady um, who apparently was known for her famous secret family fudge recipe. <laughs> so she was so famous for it in life, she wanted to continue to retain that title after death. So she did a 16-minute video on the famous secret family fudge recipe. Not so secret anymore. <laughs> but now, with those pictures, with that laser work, with this technology, I can meet people. I can meet people that I existed in the same time space with, but never had an opportunity to meet. They get to leave a bit of a legacy. They get to say, they still get to have a voice. They get to say something about who they were and, and where they came from and the things that they really enjoyed. And believe me, these folks that I've seen, there have been a lot of creative guys out there. Um, I know this seems crazy, but it's the stuff we understand today. It's technology that we use every day. 
the guy that owns Memory Medallion um, told me that he signs up about two to 300 monument makers every quarter. Now, I will be honest with you, I've never seen either of these on the landscape. I think that has a tremendous amount to do with us being puritanical northern Yankees. Um, I think this is a little too far for us to reach. I am sure that as soon as I got out of the New England area, this stuff would come cropping up all over the landscape. I have a friend that's a monument maker in Indiana, and his gravestones light up. Yeah, they do. They glow green. It's really kind of crazy. So in case you thought I was done, I warned you already how long I can talk about this stuff. But there were a few things that I wanted to be sure that you saw. This is one of the things that I needed to be sure you saw. Now, I'm pretty sure if you came down Cedar Street, came around the corner, you've seen this. I will tell you the day that I saw it, I almost drove off the road because it's on a bend. And I'm going, whoa, look at that. So not only is this an impressive monument, it's extra impressive because it's not made out of stone. See how it's that kind of blue-gray? There was a period from the last quarter of the 1800s into about the 19-teens when a company in Bridgeport, Connecticut named Monumental Bronze Company decided to get into the monument business. And what they were doing was competing with bronze monument makers. So their material, their, their monument, this new unusual thing, was called white bronze. Brilliant marketing. Because it's neither white nor is it bronze. It's kind of this blue-gray. It's not bronze, it's actually zinc. It's formed in molds. The molded pieces are transported to the cemetery and then assembled on site using more molten zinc to attach the panels together seamlessly. And the reason they called it white bronze was to compete with bronze. Bronze was a very popular monument material. It was very expensive. And what happens to bronze when you put it outside? When, what happens to bronze when air touches it at all anywhere? Yeah, it oxidizes. So it goes from being this lovely creamy coppery color to being black and green and really not so very pretty on the landscape. So this was a stab at that market, saying that, that this is something new. It's not stone. It's metal. It's reasonable cost compared to bronze. You certainly needed to have money to do something like this. But they came in all different shapes and sizes. There's no internal armature to them. They're completely hollow. They didn't have showrooms. You had a, a salesman that traveled around with a design book. And you picked, you picked this design from this page, and I'd like to have a sheath of wheat, and I'd like to have a lamb, and I'd like to have my lettering in this font. And they went back to the foundry in Bridgeport, Connecticut with your order. They poured all the casts. They brought the cast pieces back and assembled them on site. This is certainly not the biggest one I've seen, but it's damn impressive. Um, so here's your central monument, and then these little pillowy guys are all over the place. Um, they're hollow as well, and um, they have the initials or the names of each one of the family members marking the spot. So there's that very standard central monument of the family plot um, with its little pillow headstones. So this, this doesn't really catch on. Um, I have seen it. Like, certainly, the closer you are to Bridgeport, Connecticut, the more you see. I go to towns that I don't see any. I go to towns that I see a bunch. Um, and you do have some down the street in Pine Grove, too. Um, one or two, maybe. Um, if you see a lot of them on the landscape, or a lot of them in a particular town, you had a good salesman. <laughs> if you didn't see that many, or you didn't see any, not so much. So I wanted you to be aware of them. Um, these continue on until about the 19-teens. Um, I they think there's a couple of things that impacted them. They, 
they don't look that natural on the landscape, so they might have been a bit um, insulting to Victorian senses in that there's this, because these things stick out like a sore thumb. If you're looking at 500 acres and there's a, a zinky or a white bronze out there, you can see it. Um, but I think the thing that probably really caused its demise was World War I, where the foundries would be turned over and the materials would be used for the war effort. Wanted to make sure you guys saw this. There's two of these. This is a good way for a cemetery to increase its space. So this is a columbarium. It's for cremains. Um, there's one in Pine Grove. There's one in Vernon Grove. And you buy this little niche. And the, the cremains in the urn go in here. Um, it's a more green way to go, I sort of, I guess. Um, it extends the space and therefore the life of the cemetery. It helps them raise money. Because really, once all the plots are filled, where's the money coming from? So it allows them to keep um, making money to help defray the costs of actually keeping the lawn mowed and, and doing all the things that you're supposed to do when you own these places. Um, and it's an inexpensive, a, a much less inexpensive way to inter someone than uh, a cemetery plot with a vault and a casket and, and all of that stuff. I have told you to look at the tops. I've told you to look at the art. I've told you to look at the words. I've told you to look everywhere. And I want you to be sure not to forget to look down. At the very bottom of the stones, often um, meant to be either at grade or even below grade, you'll find more information. This is a signature. This is the monument maker's name. He's from Upton, just another town over. Um, often, you will also see prices chiseled in. You might see um, practice letters. So you always, you always should keep an eye on the bottom as well, because you might find some treasures down there as well. Wanted to make sure I told you about this space, these guys, too. This is the Association for Gravestone Studies, uh, international member organization. It's headquartered in Greenfield, but it's really just an administrative office there. Um, anybody involved with this at the member level is a, anywhere from a hobbyist, cemetery hobbyist to a gravestone conservator to a, an archivist or museum person uh, art historian, you name it, if you've got an interest in gravestones, these are your people. So my job this evening has been to tell you, in case you missed it, is that cemeteries are fun and interesting places. They're educational, they're time machines, they're living history museums. They're full of all sorts of valuable resources for information. I used to have it say, get out there and, and get out there today, but I usually give my programs at night, so you know it's dark and there's trip hazards and stuff, so get out there and explore. I've given you the tools tonight through the program as well as through some of the handouts um, to go out and explore on your own. That's what I want you to do. If you haven't been in there in a while, get back out there. If you've never been in, go in. You never know what you're going to find. Thank you so much for coming. Enjoy your evening. You've been delightful. Memento morning.